I never know if it's you or David that's going to get up and introduce me, but I don't give you any more information, uh, ammo than you need already. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to come back here to spring. Uh, certainly um, a lot of precious years uh, for Brenda and I to be uh, for the 17 years we were here. A uh, lot of laughter, a lot of good food, some tears. But uh, it's always amazing to me you invite me back. <laughs> I know, I know that. This may be the last time you hear me speak. The New Testament, being the Word of God, contains authoritative information about Christian living, the theme of our lectures this year. And you can be a part of the church that Christ died for, but only if you do what the Bible says to do to be saved. Whether one is a New Testament Christian or not depends on whether one has done the things that God has instructed in his word. And not everybody who calls themselves Christians today are truly following the instructions of their Christian life as they would call it also. 1 John chapter 2 verses 3 through 6, we read about that. The Bible indicates that the true Christian is one who is a follower of Christ in all things. Those who attempt less are not truly God's children. 1 John 3.10 Peter wrote, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him whom hath called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but now are the people of God, which had not attained mercy, but now have attained mercy. 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. Today we're considering some of the ways that Christians are to be different from other people in the world. How they live differently as a New Testament Christian. The people of God are, are to live in the world, but to keep them unspotted from the world, as J.D. pointed out, James 1.27, and Bruce also. Paul tells us that God has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, Colossians 1.13. And Christ expects his followers to be righteous. Matthew chapter 5, verses 6 and verse 10. Righteousness means living according to God's word, his truth. Paul said, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Romans 10, verse 3. To be righteous before God requires that we obey all his commandments. John 14, verses 15, and also verse 21. Anything else is vain. Matthew 15, 9. The apostle John said all right unrighteousness is sin in 1 John 15, verse 17. We must study God's word so that we can know his will. We must study to be ready to tell others about the gospel. 1 Peter 3.15, Romans 1.16. We must have a love of the truth. I can tell you right now, if you don't love the truth, you're not going to open up the book and you're not going to read it as much as you should. But we must have a love of his truth, 2 Thessalonians 2.10. It is only through a diligent devotion to God's word that we can increase in knowledge of God. And not everyone will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of God. We must study the Bible that we may know his will and do what he expects of us. 
God demands an active faith. We are to be doers of the word and not hearers only, James 1.22. Paul tells us to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15.58. And God expects Christians to be obedient in everything he commands, 2 Corinthians 2.9. And that brings me to the topic that David has assigned to me today. Into our hands the gospel is given. Alongside that topic that David gave, he gave a verse in the flyer, Mark 16, 15. Commonly known as the Great Commission, a commission which can also be found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, uh, Luke 24, verses 46 through 49, and John 20, 21. Why David chose Mark's version is unknown to me. But he's put me on the defensive right off the bat. Those of you who do Bible studies could possibly run into a person who will take exception to Mark 16, 15. Though I'd be surprised since most people today don't know, having a clue what the Bible says or teaches. However, before we discuss how this verse relates to our Christian living, we're going to address the potential disbelief of some concerning Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. Say you sit down and you're going to have having a Bible study with somebody and, and you have them turn in their Bibles and you want them to read Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. Good place to start sometimes. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And they turn to you and say, Well, Mark 16, 9 through 20 is not in my Bible. Or more likely they'd say something like, There's a note in my Bible that says the oldest Greek manuscripts and some authorities omit verses 9 through 20. And by the way, that's a quote from one of my ASV Bibles at home at the end of Mark. The New American Standard note at the end of Mark says some of the oldest manuscripts do not contain verses 19 through 20. The Revised Standard Version notes that some of the most ancient authorities bring the book to a close at the end of verse 8. However, another one of my American Standard Version Bibles, I guess a later edition, it's a bit more specific, saying the two oldest Greek manuscripts and some authorities omit verses 9 to the end. What are these two oldest manuscripts? Well, they're Kodak Sinaiticus and Kodak Vaticanus. So the way the Latin sounds when I Google, so, so Google tells me. Both being Greek manuscripts, which are believed to have been written in the 4th century. Codex Sinaiticus was discovered in 1859 in a wastebasket at the Monastery of St. Catherine. And Codex uh, uh, Vaticanus has been located in the Vatican Library since about 1481. There are approximately 300 what they call uncial manu manuscripts. Uh, meaning that they're written in all capital letter style, uh, written between the 4th and the 10th centuries, known to exist. And about uh, 2,700 minuscule or cursive manuscripts written in all lowercase letter style, uh, generally from the 9th century forward. And apparently, Mark 16, verses 9 through 20 is found in the large majority of these manuscripts we don't have time to spend on this topic uh, to go into a lot of depth, so I'm just going to make a couple of ob quick observations in case this question was ever come up to you. First, in contrast to the uh, Codex uh, Sinaiticus, which some describe as one of the most complete Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, <laughs> I'll tell you how it's complete here in a moment. In contrast, the Greek Codex Venaticus uh, is missing part of Hebrews. It actually stops at Hebrews 9, verse 14. 
And then it omits James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. A brother Guy in Woods wrote in the September 1988 issue of the Gospel Advocate saying this, quote, Where's the line in NIV to separate Hebrews 9.15 and Revelation 22.21? From the rest of the New Testament text, where's the explanatory note which reads, One of the most ancient and reliable manuscripts does not include Hebrews 9.15 through Revelation 22.21. Are we to conclude from this that the books never were a part of the original text? The argument for Mark 16, verse 9, is no weightier, end quote. Brother Woods, in that same issue of the Gospel Advocate, also commented on those who would contend that the, the content, content of uh, Codex Sinaiticus and uh, Vaticanus should decide what belongs to in our Bibles today. And he wrote, quote, Moreover, a little known fact is that included in the Sinaiticus manuscripts are apocryphal books with portions of Tobit, uh, Ecclesiasticus, and other non-conical writings. If the omission of Mark 16 verses 9 through 20 from this document proves the passage to be unauthentic, does the inclusion of these non-conical, apocryphal portions establish their reliability? End quote. Well, no, it doesn't. <laughs> Thus, it's obvious that the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus manuscripts cannot be derived upon alone to settle the question of whether Mark 16, verses 19 through 20 belong in the Bible, including the verse that we're talking about. But secondly, in addition to the Greek manuscripts, there are many other ancient writings called versions. The versions are translations of the scripture from the Greek into other languages. It's important, aren't all of our Bibles here the same thing? It's important to note that many of these versions are even older than these two Greek manuscripts that we're discussing. Later, in a, actually 10 years later, in September 1998 issue of the Gospel Advocate, Brother Woods notes that the old Syriac, the Ethiopic, Egyptian, Old Italic, Sahedic, and Coptic translations appearing soon after the end of the first century all contain Mark 16, verses 9 through 20. 200 years before the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus manuscripts were copied, it was translated into the scriptures that were being used after the first century. All that to say this. David made me say it. Don't be concerned if somebody objects to Mark 16, 9 through 20, and particularly verses 15 and 16 that we read. There's plenty of evidence to prove that these passages belong in our Bibles. In fact, there's no doctrine taught in Mark 16, verses 9 through 20 that isn't taught elsewhere in the scriptures. It's just sad that some will not accept the terms that Jesus gave as our only hope for salvation. Moving forward concerning Christian living, that's what we're here to talk about. Let's examine Mark 16, 15, the verse David gave me. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Does go ye mean go me? I think that's a title of a book somewhere. I want you to notice the main thought of Jesus' command in Mark's account of the Great Commission. Jesus wanted every person in the world to hear the gospel, the good news. In a parallel verse in Matthew 28, 19, it is written, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. When Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and teach all nations, he spoke to the apostles, only 11 men, as we read in Mark 16, verse 14. Imagine that Jesus said those same words to 11 men here today, and that you were one of those 11. What would your reaction, your thoughts be when you heard those words? Um, impossible? Unattainable? Irrational? Or would you be like Paul and say, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, Philippians 4.13. 
The Greek word translated as go is a verb meaning as you go or while going. Accordingly, it means teach or preach as you go or while going. Early Christians understood this. When Saul was making havoc of the church, as we read the early, was read earlier by Bruce, putting all the Christians in prison, uh, we read in Acts 4, therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. What impact did Jesus' word have on the early believers, these New Testament Christians? Well, they took the gospel, went to all the world in their generation without the benefits of the printing press, uh, radio, television, automobiles, airplanes, the internet, and then many other means of communications and travel at our disposal today. Paul wrote in Colossians 1.23, if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Evidently, they took the words of our Lord quite seriously. And what was it they were to teach and preach? Well, the gospel, the good news for man, how that Christ had died for our sins according to the scriptures and how that he was buried and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. You know, a simple way to summarize the content of the gospel is that it contains facts to be believed, to be believed commands to obey, and promises to receive. That pretty much sums up the whole of the gospel there. Man is lost in sin, for all have sinned and come short of glory, Romans 3.23. But the gospel is God's power to redeem man, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, Romans 1.16. The faith spoken in the Bible is an obedient faith. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16.16. 16. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. There's one of those promises, Revelation 2.10. In the great commission given by Jesus in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus having plenary authority, meaning all authority, as he actually mentions in verse 18 there of that passage, speaking to the 11 apostles, instructed them to make disciples of all the nations. That's the ASV version. To baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. To teach them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. Verses 19 and 20. They were told to take the gospel into all the world. But as they could not personally execute the great commission to all places and all people for all times. His commands fall upon the successors in all of his ages. That would be like these young men we were hearing today, our successors. As we noted earlier in the early church, it was those that were scattered abroad who went far and wide preaching the word. Today, that's you and I, New Testament Christians. We, as well as our successors after us, are to go forth and carry the recorded gospel message throughout the world. As Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, And the things which thou hast heard from me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others. That's one thing I can say about spring here. They do really have done a really good job of that, and I appreciate it because I'm one of the recipients. But we are to use our best efforts to spread the knowledge of Christ as we live our life day to day. To convert those who would be obedient to Christ's law is given in the New Testament. The spread of the gospel is a work for all New Testament Christians. We need to tell the world about Jesus as we've been taught and in whom is the truth. John 8, 31 and 32. So yes, go ye means go me. So how does this impact our own Christian living? What is your reaction when you realize that go ye means go me? Well, as you go, what are you doing? While you're going about your daily life, you are to teach. Matthew 28, 19. 
The Greek word translated as teach in Matthew 28, 19 literally means to make disciples. The Greek word translated as teaching in the next verse, verse 20, means to impart instruction to explain and expound the thing. It's odd that I've got two different versions of what the, uh, they translated the Greek there, two different ways. But uh, they use teaching both, but one actually means to make disciples. The other one means to teach and expound, to explain. Put it all together, we're told that when we have the opportunity to make disciples, as we go about our daily life, instructing our fellow men about the gospel, and that they are to observe all things which the Lord has commanded. That's literally what it's saying is when you put it all together. But to make someone a disciple, there must be teaching. That to become a disciple, a New Testament Christian, one must learn things. They must learn that they have sinned. They must learn that they are separated from God. Hence, they are lost. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. They must learn about God and his love for mankind. John 3.16. They must learn of man's plan of redemption, of God's plan of redemption. They need to believe. They need to repent. They need to confess Jesus as the Son of God. And they need to be baptized for, for the remission of the forgiveness of sins. Acts 2.38, Acts 8.37, verse 38. Afterwards, they must continue learning of God's law for man. It's not a one and done. In all the duties of Christian life, you know, we read of this requirement when we read a while ago to observe all things that Jesus commanded. That makes it clear that New Testament Christianity is not a, an evolving system subject to man's worldly wisdom. Rather, it's a doctrinal teaching was to remain static by observing what the Lord has commanded. This teaching takes place both prior to baptism and follows baptism. It is an ongoing process. And for the faithful New Testament Christian, it will be a lifetime of learning, understanding and relearning, Remembering and being reminded, but most importantly, obeying. This is part of Christian living. While, while originally the commission was given to the 11 apostles at that time, don't forget that he instructed the apostles to teach the disciples all things whatsoever I commanded you, and that would include go into the world and make disciples meaning they must teach the disciples, New Testament Christians, to do the same thing. Thus, all Christians are under this great commission. In Matthew 28, verse 20, Jesus made a promise, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, he said that to those 11 men. But J.W. McGarvey, in his New Testament commentary, wrote, the promise was made primarily to the 11, but inasmuch as they were not to live till the end of the world. It properly extends to the entire church of which they were the recognized representative. Paul understood and realized the value of the Lord's promise. He wrote, At my first defense, no one took my part, but all forsake me. May it not be laid to their account. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, and through me the message might be fully proclaimed and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered from the mouth of the lion. 2 Timothy 4 verses 16 and 17. So I ask again, what's your reaction when you realize that go ye really means go me? That we have been told to make disciples as we go about our daily life, as we have opportunity to instruct our fellow man about the gospel, and teaching that they are to observe all things that the Lord has commanded. And in doing so, the Lord will be with us in a providential way to watch over us, to protect us, to care for us. Is your first thought, I can't do that? I hope not. However, I understand that not everyone can 
go for various reasons. It might be uh, health, it could be age, it, there may be other legitimate reasons. So you might ask, what can I do? How can I help? Well, first, if you're able to go, then you must. It's a commandment. And you know what James said in 417, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth not, it's a sin. That was going to snag a lot of people. The Lord opens doors for those who are prepared to serve. Descriptions often speak of an open door. Some doors the Lord opens, such as an open door for Paul at Ephesus in 1 Corinthians 16.9. And though not fully utilized by Paul, he mentions another door that was opened at Troas in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Who can he use to teach? If we desire to have doors open, we must prepare ourselves to be useful to the master. We must be prepared for every good work, 2 Timothy 2.21. This applies to congregations as well as individuals. Individuals should prepare themselves to be able to teach or at least to lead souls to those who can and are ready to teach. Additionally, congregations must be ready to assimilate new converts into the family of God where they can be nurtured during a very vital stage of their new life. So many times we drop the ball on that. They come out of the water, we give them a towel, and that's it. How can we really expect the Lord to use us in his providence if we're not prepared? But perhaps you're a new Christian, you don't have the ability to teach others yet. You can certainly tell them what's happened to you, but... You know, or maybe your health is a hindrance. Uh, or you, your age interferes with your ability and mobility to, to go. Uh, teaching's not the only thing you can do to help convert souls. The church is the body of Christ, with Jesus being the head of the body. And like our own bodies, different members can perform different roles. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 31. Who can God use to encourage? Who can he use to invite people to worship? Who can he use to lead those souls uh, to those who can conduct Bible studies? Who can teach our young? Who can use, he use to make phone calls, to follow up with visitors, to hand out pamphlets, to be a faithful Christian so different from the world so as that some people take notice and question why and perhaps open a door. Who can he use to serve? Are each of us serving as good example of those inside as well as those outside the church? All these things are part of daily Christian living or at least they should be. Do we really care if we convert those lost in the world as, as well as those erring Christians who are falling away? Can we really expect him to open a door for a congregation if it's made up of uncaring and therefore unprepared Christians? Evangelism is sharing the gospel by individual Christians and helping those who preach and teach. Just as John praises beloved Gaius for doing in 3 John verses 5 through 8. In this way, we too can become fellow workers for the truth. Perhaps we can see why the gospel was spread so fast in the first century. Not just preachers, not just apostles, but all of Christians, both collectively as faithful congregations and individually, were involved in spreading the gospel, either sending or helping or supporting or going themselves. Finally, let me suggest a few thoughts as to why evangelism is important. When evangelism ceases, Christians diminish. They can waste away and can be cut off from not, for not bearing fruit, John 15, verses 1 through 8. Even congregations can be removed from their relationship with the Lord and die because they have left their first love or have become dead as did the churches of Ephesus and Sardis in Revelations uh, 2 verses 1 through 5 and chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. 
Evangelism, of course, is sharing the gospel by all Christians, not just the preacher and elders, but all of us, as mentioned, following the persecution in Jerusalem. We heard about a couple times a day in Acts 8. Our duty as people of God is to proclaim his praises, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. As a result, we need to always be prepared to give a reason for our hope in Christ. Peter wrote about that. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks of you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But what about us today? Are we proclaiming the gospel of Christ as we should to our friends, our neighbors, to those in our communities, to those we work with, other places? If not, perhaps we ought to ask ourselves this question. Are we ashamed of the gospel? When was the last time you personally shared the gospel with someone? And I'm not talking about just discuss some religious topic, but literally talking of the gospel of Jesus Christ, what he did for mankind. Is sharing the gospel no longer a priority for you today? Is sharing the gospel with the lost no longer a priority of individual New Testament Christians and congregations of the Lord's church today? Hopefully, we're not ashamed of Jesus and his word. Jesus himself claimed that some might be ashamed of him and his words. He said in Mark chapter 8, verse 38, Whosoever, therefore, shall be ashamed of me and my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also, the Son of Man, be ashamed when he cometh in, his, in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I'm almost positively certain there's nobody here today that wants Jesus to be ashamed of you when he returns. And that's a position you don't want to find yourself in. But then perhaps through influence by a sinful, adulterous generation, it's not just our generation. There's been generations before us and there'll be generations after us. Some have become embarrassed to talk about Jesus or perhaps appearing foolish to others. You know, Paul admitted that the message of the cross is foolishness to many in 1 Corinthians 1.18. Preaching Christ crucified can be both a stumbling block and foolishness to many, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 22-23. And many people today consider the true gospel foolish. Are we ashamed to talk about Jesus and his gospel to others because of that? Are we trying to please God or men? Paul wrote that we either please men or God, Galatians 1.10. If we're concerned with pleasing men, we are not faithful servants of Christ. Who are we trying to please today? Family, friends, neighbors, co-workers, or God? Even when the Son of God was walking on this earth, some would not confess Jesus, even though they believed in him. They loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. John 12, verses 42, 43. Whose praise do we seek today? Man's or God's? There may be other reasons why proclaiming the gospel is not a priority for many New Testament Christians today, but I suspect that many are just simply ashamed of what others might think of them. However, let me offer reasons why we should not be ashamed. The gospel is the power of God into, uh, into salvation, which is why Paul was not ashamed of the gospel and why he was ready to preach it. Peter said the gospel needed to be preached because it contains incorruptible seed through which one is born again. It is the word of God which lives and abides forever. And he said that, uh, not verbatim like that, but 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23-25. Like the rest of God's word, it is living and powerful. 
For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 4.12 The gospel with words. When obeyed is salvation from our past sins, Romans 6.23. It has the power to help us weather storms that are in our life, the storms of life. We've all had them. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. There are other reasons for faithful New Testament uh, Christians to not be ashamed of the gospel. Jesus is not ashamed to call us brethren, Hebrews 2, 11. And God is not ashamed to be called our God, Hebrews eleven sixteen. Also, so that we can have confidence that we not be ashamed of the Lord's coming, John wrote this. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming, 1 John two twenty eight. So what we learn today? New Testament Christians must examine themselves regularly to see whether they are living as Christians. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, 1 Corinthians 9, 27. And whatsoever our task, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, Colossians three twenty-three. We need to go about this task heartily, seriously. And don't forget what Paul said that I quoted earlier. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, Philippians 4.13. He also cautioned us to put on the whole armor of God. It's a war out there. We need to be prepared to fight the good fight, to keep the faith, Ephesians 6.10-17, 2 Timothy 4.7. But even with God's help, many will suffer persecution and tribulation as New Testament Christians while we're doing his work and living the Christian life. 1 Peter 4.16, we can read that in other places. But we must learn to rejoice even in our tribulations. We have the same problem <clears throat> A fish hatchery with old people get up and walking around. <laughs> we must learn to rejoice even in our tribulations. Yes, there are going to be tribulations. It's not easy taking the gospel to a lost and dying world. It's not always easy. You have to learn to deal with the rejection. You have to learn to deal with ignorance. But boy, it sure is a good feeling when you find one that wants to learn. Because of our love for and responsibility to God, we must strive to follow the New Testament pattern of Christian living. And that includes going forth as we live our life, and spreading the gospel where and when we can because as the song we sang at the beginning of this tells us into our hands the gospel is given. Ken, I'll let you have some minutes. Just don't say anything about me. <laughs> <laughs>